All right, let's get started here. Uh, obviously, thank everyone for uh, joining us here today. Um, we'll just start out and let Ryan talk a minute about returning to the racetrack, uh, obviously after a hiatus since his uh, accident in Daytona, and then uh, a hiatus with the sport in general. So, Ryan? Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to see you all in, uh, in the capacity that I can after everything that happened in Daytona. I uh, feel very blessed and fortunate, as I think you've read or heard me say several times to uh, be able to talk to you guys and uh, get the opportunity to return to my race car seat, not just any seat, but my race car seat and um, Burlington of all places being my favorite racetrack. So look forward to uh, getting down there on Sunday and, um, you know, having the uh, like expedited weekend, I guess you'd say, um, and the opportunity to, uh, to um, get sports, uh, back rolling again when it comes to NASCAR. All right, so what we'll try to do is get through as many questions as you guys have. So if you want to do the raise your hand icon or you can type your question however you're most comfortable doing it or you can wave your hand. Just I'd ask you to, to stay on mute if you're not asking a question and then when uh, I'll unmute you when, when you have one. So who wants to start out? Claire B. Newman, we have missed you obviously all this time. And my question for you is, as you come back into all of it and all this extra stuff is thrown at you, all this extra stuff comes your way. Um, is there a lot more for you to digest? Because even some of the drivers that have been doing this all along have I had to add some things to digest here. How about you, man? I mean, I know it's different and I guess it's got some complexities to it, but in the end, um, we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think we were capable of it. So that's, that's a combination of everything. That's a combination of, of uh, going to the racetrack with no practice, no qualifying, um, you know, the situation that we have with the virus uh, and making sure that we're staying healthy and keeping our distance, uh, being socially acceptable and doing so. Um, you know, it's all manageable. It just is going to be different. Uh, but the reality is, is once we get the green flag to drop, aside from a mandatory caution, um, it's going to be racing and racing as the fans have always enjoyed it. And hopefully we can um, set a standard that um, allows everybody, including the fans, to uh, enjoy the race and have fun. Jack Roush told me that you were going to be like a 16 year old who just got his driver's license. You would be so excited. Is that true? Hell, I'm like that every day. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank Let's you. Let's go to Jeff Gluck. Ryan, I guess one thing that um, is still uh, amazing to me is is that you know you're here at all. Um, from from your your understanding and everything you know now about the crash, um, what happened inside the car to allow you to survive and be here talking to us today? Well, I think you can uh, pay a lot of attribution to the safety of the race car, the safety of my helmet, my equipment. I mean, I can, I can, um, I mean, whatever. They always say things happen for a reason, and this was this year was the um, probably the fourth race that I had on a brand new style helmet. Um, uh, awry or the um, the uh, it's a carbon fiber uh, zero helmet that uh, I was wearing that uh, first time I second time I had worn it in cup competition, and um, I don't know you name it, uh, everything aligned um, in so many ways. Um, you know the safety workers the personnel that were involved that uh, were inside the car with me, spent time with me during and after the crash, every, every layer of it. Um, there was multiple miracles, big miracles and little miracles in my opinion that, um, that um, aligned for me to be able to, uh, to walk out days later with my hands around my daughters and, and uh, to be thankful. So, um, I can't answer all those things, and I don't think anybody can when miracles do happen, but um, we need to be thankful for that, at least I am, and um, you know, I'm I just proud of how everybody's united in the past, say, 20 years that I've been involved in the sport to make the tracks safer, the walls safer, the cockpit safer, the seats safer, um, you know, all the work that's gone into that collectively by not just the NASCAR world, but everybody. Um, you know, people in sprint car racing, people in Indy car racing, it's, it's uh, the net result. I am the net result, or at least I feel like I am. It's not just a Newman bar. It's not just a Petty bar or an Earnhardt bar. It's, it's a, the net 
effort of everybody in auto racing um, that I think contributed up to that day. All right, uh, Bob Pockers. Yeah, Ryan, there were so many rumors going on around about your health in the hours after the accident. Um, do you know what, from a medical standpoint, what your condition was? How, I mean, how touch and go was it um, whether you would live? I had no idea. Uh, I was medically treated to that to not know. Um, you know, they were trying to keep me in a somewhat of a medically uh, induced coma from what I've been told. And that medicine uh, kind of zoned me out. So I really don't have any memories or recollection of any of my crash until I actually had my arms around my daughters walking out of the hospital. Um, again, when they give you those medicines and you're knocked out, you don't know what's going on um, and you have no control over it because they're, they're pumping it into you for a reason, a medical reason. And, and um, you know, I, again, I just feel blessed that I was able to walk out in the condition that I was and as I watched um, in the next, um, call it 24 hours, as I watched um, the crash and had to make myself believe what I had went through, and I really looked to my dad to say, hey, did, I, did this really happen? Like it was, it was kind of like, it, it, there's no deja vu when there's no deja. I mean, it's like, yeah, it was just kind of like, all right, I believe you. Um, it's crazy. I'm happy I'm here. I mean, so did you ask and like, were, did they do any other medical procedures besides putting you in a medically induced coma? No, I had nothing, nothing that was wrong with me. I've got, um, I guess they put a pick line in my shoulder, which I'm not really sure exactly what all that was for. Um, and, and medically, I was just treated so that I could be calm um, so that they would kind of um, numb my brain, so to speak, so that I could just sit there and rest. And um, I wouldn't say call it a vegetative state, but I was, I was, um, I wasn't a fruit either. <laughs> it was, it was, I was, um, I was meant to be um, relaxed. Okay. I will go to Dustin Long and Tucker White. Thank you. A couple of things for Ryan. Um, I guess you've been on the Darlington track more recently than anybody else. What was that test like? How did that help you through that? And I'm guessing just a few laps, or can you kind of take me through that first of all, please? Yeah, we went down and did. Um, about 30 laps total at speed. Um, did two five lap runs, kind of checked the tires out and then put another set of tires on for a 20 lap run and wanted to see um, how I felt in the car. I had no apprehensions getting in the car. I was excited to get in the car. It's my favorite racetrack and just really wanted to get back in it and at it. And um, it had been working really hard to uh, do the things that I needed to do uh, test wise to you know pass my concussion testing protocol and things like that so that I could could be down there with my team and Dr. Petty to, um, you know, establish the fact that I felt well and, and could prove it and drive well behind the race, behind the seat of the race car. So um, I basically did that. I mean, I, I, um, the track was really green. It was really fast. Um, my first five laps of my 20 lap run were quicker than the pole winning car from last fall. So I can handle the speed. Um, there's no issue with that. Just uh, wanted to, uh, you know, kind of get that behind me and uh, Darlington being, kind of close to home and away from a little bit of everything else um, for me was no different than how Dale Jr. did it. You, you, you take an opportunity to go down and, and um, you know, shake things down, um, make sure that uh, everything's um, connected. I also just want to ask quickly, in what ways might some relationships with competitors have changed because of this? Obviously it's the first time you've been injured to such to a significant degree a lot of people are reaching out. I'm just wondering if relationships have kind of changed with drivers. I think you're kind of one that kind of has a very small select group and more than likely brings your friends to the track as opposed to have as many. And I'm just curious how that's changed. And I know that you're a tough SOB on the track, but does the, do the relationships impact anything in how you might race people one way or the other? I guess I guess I brought Matt Kenseth out of retirement. So He's so excited to race against me. He, he decided to come back and race again. So, um, you know, I, in all in all actuality, I'm just really excited to uh, to get back at it. I got lots of great texts and phone calls and connections from other drivers and other crew members and you know personnel that um, that are from the racetrack and even away from the racetrack. The amount of texts and communication that I got, um, I I'm it's not 
it's not a joking matter, but I mean, it's like, it's like being at somebody's wake, but you live through it. Like it, it was just the amount of, it's like being there, but you're being that person and being able to kind of connect uh, with the people that um, wanted to connect with you. Um, when you go to awake and you can't typically connect with that person, you can only connect with the family. I was, I was, I felt like that. And, um, and I look forward to getting back on the racetrack and kind of putting it all behind me. But at the same time, like I said, to be thankful for what I've experienced. Thank you. Tucker White. Right. Yeah, the court up. All right. Thank you, uh, Ryan. First off, glad to see you're all right and ready to get back to racing. And I'm pretty sure everyone in this room probably shares that sentiment. Now, uh, this is probably a great question for you, given your co college education. But with this engineered and simulation heavy as NASCAR has become now, what challenges, if any, does racing, uh, going into race mode on a at track like Darlington present without any practice or qualifying? It's the same thing that we do when we get, get there, we unload, and we try to go fast our first laps of practice. The difference is these laps of practice are actually race laps, and they mean something, and they, you know, over 400 laps, they, they add up, or 400 miles, whatever it is, they add up, and and uh, I don't see it as a huge challenge. It is definitely going to be a challenge. I mean, you don't want to be the first guy to be smashing your splitter going into turn one at Darlington uh, when you're going to enter the corner with somebody outside of you. You just don't know those things. So you just have to think about it. Uh, no different than you would uh, if you were in practice when you're entering right next to the wall. Let's just say a place like Homestead, you enter right next to the wall. You don't do it on your first lap, but you will at some point and you got to make sure that you have the confidence. So you got to work your way into that level of confidence and, and uh, we'll have plenty of laps in Darlington to do that on Sunday. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go to Alex from the observer. There we go. Uh, hey Ryan, it's good to be uh, talking to you right now. Um, I actually have two quick questions. One, I know that, you know, you had mentioned that you had a bruised brain after after the fact, but I'm curious what kind of the official medical ruling was that? Did you have a concussion or or what was like the official diagnosis? <laughs> I can self-diagnose myself, right? Um, you know, the, the, <laughs> the, there was a little bit of confusion and I've had doctors tell me that I had a concussion and then I have talked to other doctors who said I didn't have a concussion. Then I went back and talked to the same doctor that said I had a concussion. He says, no, you really didn't have a concussion what you had was this. And that's why I put it kind of in layman's terms of having a bruised brain, because everybody knows what a, a bruise is. You can't see a concussion, right? It's, it's just a medical diagnosis. But a bruise, you can see. And, and, and the part of your brain, or the fact that my brain was, was injured, I guess, in this accident to the point that it knocked me out, and I don't remember the actual you know, parts of the accident that day, um, tells me that something happened, right? So I kind of self-diagnosed myself with that bruised brain because the reality is you need to give time for a bruise to heal. And that's what I needed was time for my brain to heal. And, um, you know, I've, I've really felt completely normal since, I guess, in the last eight weeks, no problem, um, no question. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I was. And that's why when it comes time to having a bruise heal, especially when you can't see, you have to be extra careful. Yeah, and then my, my second question is, you mentioned that moment when you were walking out of the hospital with your daughters, and you sort of had, that was the first time that you were able to recollect what happened. I mean, what do you remember from those final moments, I guess? And have you been reliving that experience a lot? Uh, you know, this, I think that's, that's the part of, for me, that makes me feel how special it really was, the miracle part of it, because... I don't remember anything about being in the hospital. I couldn't tell you who came to visit me. I couldn't tell you who was in the room, but I do remember putting my arms around my daughter's chests and walking out and, and holding their hands as I did that. And that, that tells me that God was involved. That tells me that I was, I was blessed in more ways than one and um, makes me so thankful for what I went through and being able to, you know, have the people around me that I love and trust afterwards. So um, just, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it more than that. It's just, I feel a complete, like a complete walking miracle. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's go to Greg Engel. Greg, I believe you're muted there. Yeah, the story of my life. Um, 
Ryan, uh, it, it's so great to see you back. I was sitting in the press box that night. It was, it was horrible. Um, but when you finally did come back and you did the test at um, Darlington, was there any, I mean, you know, like jumping back up on the horse kind of thing, was there any, any kind of nervousness before you started the test? And, and do you think that, that doing that test at Darlington helped ease, uh, you know, ease your nerves, so to speak, in coming back to racing and being able to go to your, what you call your favorite track uh, this weekend? I actually felt just the opposite. I was so excited and ready to go and just kind of prove myself that I actually had to slow myself down and make sure that I didn't go out there and fence it on the first lap by trying too hard. Um, so I never, I never felt like I had to be apprehensive towards it, just other than the fact that I wanted to make sure that I didn't mess up my own test. I was there to prove that, you know, I was valid in the seat again. And that, um, that made it a bit of a challenge for me personally because it is my favorite racetrack. And when the track's green like that, you just want to go haul the mail. And um, I, I had to slow myself down for a few laps, like I said, and then everything was, was good. So, um, you know, it, it'll be a little bit of that again um, when we go back on Sunday. Um, but I'll have 39 other cars around me and somebody to kind of gauge off of too. Do you, and, and do, you, do you expect to run every lap? You don't have any, any trepidation about, not, about being able to do the whole race? and having a backup or anything. I'm hoping to do every lap and then one more after that. I think they call that the victory <laughs> lap still. I was ready to do that great. in Daytona. It's great <laughs> to see you back, seriously. Thank you. Thank Just you. Have fun this weekend. Thank you. All right, we'll let's go to Rebecca White. Awesome. Ryan, um, thank you. It's a pleasure getting to talk to you. I want to, um, I don't know if you have already answered this and I apologize if, if I missed it, but when the crash started, and do you, was there was was there any kind of a thought at that point? Did you, um, I guess, was there did it completely go blank, or did you have any thought in that? I've got two questions, and I guess how excited are you to get back? You know, we've all been wanting sports, and so many of our sports have been on hold. And what an honor, and how exciting NASCAR, you know, to step out and to to take the um, big leap, and you know, all eyes are going to be on NASCAR watching how it's done, and and I know NASCAR is uh, covering all of its bases, so to speak, making sure that, you know, that they go to all measures to keep the drivers and everyone safe. And how excited are you about that? I, I don't remember any part of the lights out in the crash. Like, I, I really don't. I don't know how much of that was the crash, the impact, you know, part of whatever I had for an injury or just the uh, medication that went along with it. Um, again, I was kind of hung upside down in the car. And I know that I was – fighting the medical crew there for a little while and, and they um they kind of help help to uh, help me out in more ways than one but um I really don't have any recollection of the last lap um and, and everything after that until I walked out of the hospital with my daughters and yes I, I am excited I'm super excited not just for myself but for our sport um I think our sport will hopefully lead by example of how to get the world, if not the United States, back on track and, and enjoy some of the things that we love and, and give people some, some of that normalcy back that, um, that we haven't had for a couple months here. We need, uh, we need this uh, new normal. We need this. <laughs> <laughs> I was Thank fine you. with the old normal, but whatever the new normal is, we'll have to deal with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to Edgar Thompson. Excuse me, I was muted. Hey, Ryan, uh, have you watched the, in, the entire race? And I, I know you're just happy to be healthy and, and where you're at now, but is there a level of disappointment with the way it, I mean, you were right there to win. I have not watched the entire race. Um, I've actually been kind of saving that for a moment that'll be a little bit later in time here. Um, because I don't remember the the majority of the race, um, so I I am um, I am I am still disappointed in the fact that I have seen the replays and know that I was that close to a second Daytona 500 victory, but that's just the way it works. Um, I've always said in this sport, when you win a race one way, you will eventually lose a race that way, um, and I lost a race that way. So hopefully someday I can win a race that way and. And, um, you know, it's kind of like the what comes around goes around and everything has a cycle. Um, I've, I've experienced that with, you know, rain-shortened races and winning them and losing them, uh, so to speak. And, 
and um, I think that's just a, a part of of what racing is. Why, why is Darlington your favorite track? I just like it because you run right up next to the fence. It's unique on both ends. It's very challenging. Uh, just a lot of fun to uh, to actually hustle the car around there. Thanks for doing this. Yep. Thank you. All right. Let's go to Stephen Toronto. See, there we go. Should be unmuted. Uh, Ryan, you had after after your accident at Daytona, there had been some talk of potential uh, rule changes at Daytona and Talladega, and there were a couple of technical bulletins uh, just released by NASCAR pertaining to those changes. How much how much input did you have into those changes, and uh, what other suggestions would you have as far as as far as race procedure, keeping cars from going airborne uh, like yours did, things of that nature. Well, if you've, if you've been a part of our sport for the last 10 years, you know that I've been a big, big advocate for keeping the race cars on the ground. Um, and that's always been and always will be the safest place for them uh, to be able to use the retaining walls effectively and things like that. So I, um, I, I would love to take all the credit. Um, but I don't deserve all the credit when it comes to things from the past, like the Newman bar. That was, that was NASCAR's development over a crash that I had had. I believe it was in Talladega in like 2009, 10 or 11, something like that. When uh, I flipped and landed upside down and my cage crushed um, a, a significant amount. They, uh, they realized that they needed to make an improvement. They made it. They called it the Newman bar. Um, I was literally just the crash test dummy that lived through it. But I also did have some input. And I've had some input post 2020 Daytona 500. Um, not a lot, but again, um, they've, they have talked to me about some things. They worked with the team at, at Roush Fenway Racing uh, to help devise some new things with the race car. Um, big things like uh, chassis structure, little things like window net safety, uh, commonizing some things to, um, to make them safer for everybody. Um, you know, we've, we've always had a degree of freedom with certain things on the race car, but when it comes to safety, NASCAR has um, made us made us realize that there is a standard that needs to be followed, and that's just an example of one of the things that um, that we learned from from uh, my Daytona crash was my window net was in was secured, but it was not secured correctly um, to the point that it was still latched, but it was not ready for the next shot, so to speak, and um, things like that 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 have been a part of what we have done post. Daytona 500 um, that um, will continue on to make NASCAR safer and hopefully other sports safer for the same reason. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Yep, thank you. All right, uh, we'll, we'll Conkle. Hey, Ryan, good to see you again, buddy. Uh, wish we were flying around doing our Mission 600 stuff instead. Yeah. But uh, thanks for thanks for doing this. To that point, you're honoring first responders. Does this mean a little bit more to you to honor first responders after what they did for you? And second of all. How awesome is it just that NASCAR gets to be on the front and center stage of sports returning and what that means for your guys' sport? Well, I've, I've definitely learned a different perspective for first responders, but I've learned a different perspective for lots of people. Um, as a parent, um, and this is not to take away from first responders, but as a parent who is trying to teach a second and third grader with all this stuff that's going on, I've learned a greater appreciation for teachers as well. So um, I'm just, um, you know, proud to um, – to be in this position that I am and um, be able to give thanks to the people that in so many ways help us, um, not just this weekend with the first responders to go along with the virus and the pandemic that's, that's been a part of our world. But obviously as we get to Memorial Day weekend with the, the soldiers um, that uh, we pay tribute to past, present and future uh, to give us the freedom in our country. So several different layers of gratefulness and thankfulness that um, you know, NASCAR has always been proud to, uh, to represent and um, as a, a standard of leading um, a lot of those things uh, compared to other sports. So um, I, I look forward to uh, having some names um, outside of mine on my race car uh, in, in multiple ways at multiple times as we pay tribute to many people who make a difference in our world. And to that second question, just how awesome is it for NASCAR to be the front and center of, you know, leading our way back and NASCAR just getting all that attention that, you know, they may not have happened with all the other stuff going on. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that it's, it's great. Uh, the way the industry, the way the people, the teams, the sponsors, the, the, the broadcasting partners, 
um, the sanctioning body as, as all grouped together to make this their play, so to speak. Uh, you know, Sunday at Darlington is going to be a huge opportunity for us to connect to millions of people in, in ways that maybe we haven't had since 1979 uh, when we had a snowstorm on the East Coast. So, um, you know, I think it's just a, a big opportunity. Uh, and we're all going to work really hard to make the best of it, just as we do each and every day. But um, this is a unique opportunity for us to shine and um, for me personally to um, get back on the horse at the same time. All right, uh, Nate Ryan. Yeah, I have a question about Darlington, Ryan. I know that's, uh, you said your favorite track. I, I presume that's also part of your appreciation of history. Obviously, it's been around a long time. You've been around long enough to know that there was, at one point, it didn't seem like Darlington would be in NASCAR's long-term plans. And now it's kind of the epicenter of NASCAR for the next five or six days or whatever. Um, what do you think it means for NASCAR, Darlington being its, you know, one of its most historic speedways to be in the middle of all of this? I think it's a great opportunity for Darlington, for the fans. Um, we, um, we know it's kind of close to home. Uh, it's, it's, um, and like I said, it is one of my favorite racetracks, if not my favorite racetrack. I, um, I've always equated um, my favorite all-time racetrack, Winchester Speedway, to, to Darlington being the closest thing to Winchester in the Cup Series. So um, I, I, I have liked it for many reasons. Uh, as you said as well, the, uh, the uh, history of our sport, um, you know, there was a point in time where, you know, we, we decided to step away from Darlington, and this is an opportunity to kind of come back and, and um, you know, give it another shot in, in, in a different way but all for the right reasons. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Matt Baker. Hey, Ryan, have you wrapped your head around the fact that there won't be fans? And what are your kind of thoughts on what that's going to be like? Now, when you're running 200 miles an hour, you can't look in the stands anyway. So I, um, I, 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 I'm aware of the current situation, and I feel bad for the fans that they can't be there. Uh, but from a driver's perspective, um, until you're doing burnouts uh, or donuts in Victory Lane, um, you don't have, at least I don't have, a, um, a mentality or, or a picture of fans or no fans in the grandstands. So, um, you know, I, I wish that they were there. I completely do. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a topic all in itself. But at the same time, uh, it's an opportunity for us to connect to the people that are doing the right thing and being socially distant, staying at home and watching the race on TV. and and, um, you know, I'm sure that um, the broadcast partners are all teed up and ready to do the best job that they can to, to make sure that they give the best broadcast that they possibly can to those fans. Thank you. Yes, Liz. Oh, hi. Thanks. Um, Ryan, so glad to see you back. Thanks for doing this, Kevin. Thanks for arranging it. Um, we saw the last two months, Ryan, in your various interviews, how many different hobbies and responsibilities you have between the farm and classic cars and, and your daughters. So I just wondering if you could distill what is so compelling about being behind the wheel that you really must be there on, on Sunday when, when obviously whenever you retire, you're not going to hurt for things to do. You have tons that you could do <laughs> and would to. love to do. You're right, and I've got a list oh, of, of uh, opportunities outside of racing, and I'm I'm happy that I've been able to spend some time with my daughters. Um, <clears throat> for anybody that actually, like you, has paid attention, we um, we we're getting really close on the Bill Elliott model that I was working on a month and a half or so ago. So um, hopefully we can get that all done before Darlington as well. But yeah, I, I enjoy the outdoor life. I enjoy farming. I enjoy my cows, the buffalo. Uh, last week we had three buffalo calves, so that that keeps me busy. Just keeping an eye on them, making sure they stay inside the fence. But um, I I really just enjoy racing. Uh, I've been a race fan all my life. Um, my dad got me started racing quarter midgets when I was four and a half, and if you can remember before you were four and a half, you're a unique person. So um, I I just um, I'm excited about getting back behind the wheel, um, and I have a goal in my life to be a cup champion. And I feel like I'm with the team and have the opportunity to do that. And we were really close to proving and, uh, you know, securing ourselves a playoff berth in Daytona. And we have plenty more opportunities uh, to do that uh, before those last 10 races this year. So um, 
still uh, still riding that that wave from the last 20 years I guess is the real answer and um, when I when that wave hits the beach I'll figure out what I'm gonna do next <laughs> okay thank you let's go to Deb Williams hey Ryan it's nice to see you in person so to speak <laughs> thanks Miss Deb how are you Ryan, thank you um, I apologize if this has been asked previously, but just as Claire got ready to answer her, ask her question, my computer switched to headphones. So I missed some of that. But number one was, did you pick where you did your, your test or did NASCAR want you to do that before they signed off on clearing you to come back? And also while your brain was healing from the bruise, were there special therapies or exercises you were supposed to do or how did that process take place? Yeah, they, um, I think it was a collective effort, uh, mostly NASCAR to choose Darlington. I think it was um, a part of what had been, done, had been done in the past. Dale Jr., I believe, to my knowledge, had spent some time down there after his situation um, a few years ago. So uh, it's, it's geographically close. Um, it gave us an opportunity to kind of step away and do what we needed to do. Um, so it, it worked out. And, and again, it is one of my favorite racetracks, so I wasn't going to argue that one. And um, let's see, the second part of your question was, go ahead. Sorry. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, the second part of the question was, well, you talked about you had to give your brain the bruise. Of oh, yeah, brain the, the, time time, the time to heal. Um, really, it was mm -hmm. just time to heal. Um, going back to the bruise part of my um, self-assessed <laughs> um, situation and, and health condition, my, I, I felt great. I acted great. I had no balance problems, no memory problems. Um, I just needed to give it some time um, to, to really know that it was – um, healed, at least healed to the best it could be. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, I've, I've suggested and I'm, I'm not, um, maybe this isn't the correct place to talk about it, but just some of the protocols and things that we can do after me living through and experiencing this, what we can do to be more prepared for all race car drivers um, prior to uh, a race or a season or a career to know what your capability is mentally as a person. Um, and, and we all know that that changes every day. Some days you're having good days. Some days you're having bad days. Some days you can hit nine out of 10 free throws and some days you can't hit but one. But um, the reality is, is, you know, there's a baseline that's out there that we all need to have a really good understanding of. And that um, has an effect on uh, the status of an athlete. And um, I think that um, is something that we definitely can, can make smoother um, as we go forward. Um, for everybody. All right, let's go back to Bob. Yeah, Ryan, thanks again for doing this. Um, do you do you know, did Corey's car hit your, did his actual car hit your helmet, and is that assumed, and do you, do you assume that is when the brain injury occurred? I don't have anything that is conclusive that says that his car hit my helmet. I do know that parts of the inside of my car um, Hit, hit my helmet and, and crushed it, so to speak. Um, I don't have any defined video that I could give you a hundred percent answer that says this is exactly the second that this happened. Um, but I see the end result and that my helmet did have contact. My Hans did have contact. Um, and I was being moved backwards in my seat as his car was moving me forward. So I can't honestly tell you what percentage of that inertia and those physics that went into the actual action of the crash were being driven by his car hitting me or his car hitting my roll bars. Um, you know, it just, it's not, it's not a fair assessment to, to say, but it, all, everything happened really quick and everything um, was all in that compartment basically. And that's what um, it was, I guess it would be like a, a case of high quality whiplash that kind of happened when I was hit. And I know you've kind of addressed it, but do you, I mean, is there any one thing or that either was in the car or that the medical personnel did on site that you feel like saved your life? 
I don't know. I ha- I've had brief, a brief conversation in Phoenix with a couple people that were in the car. Um, one that was, I believe, in the car with me. Um, and we talked about having a conversation later and haven't had that conversation yet. Um, and I'm sure that we will. But I do believe that everybody, um, everybody had some kind of um, impact on keeping me safe. Um, you know, I, I, one, of my, one of my biggest questions in talking to some of the doctors when they were looking at my brain scans was if they could tell that I was without oxygen for any amount of time. Um, and they said, based off my scans, that it, they, they looked like that I had no signs of lack of oxygen to my brain, which was, you know, a great piece of news and feedback. Um, but again, I couldn't tell you if that was because uh, of what they did inside the car, if it was because of how I was hit or the quality of safety equipment or what. I don't, I don't have all those answers and I don't think that they'll ever exist unless you're that person and can say that, yes, I I got the piece of ice out of the straw and now he can breathe. You know, that unless that, that comment is there, which I don't know of, um, then it was just some crazy actions. All right, Dustin Albano. Hey Ryan, good to see you. Um, I think it was February 26th, so nine days after the incident, uh, Roush Fenway, the, their social channels posted that you were at the shop. Uh, I'm curious what it was like seeing the guys at the shop, you know, nine days after the incident. Uh, well, it was unique because uh, I'd never been to a race shop in that capacity. I literally had just came up from uh, um, Florida, uh, I believe a couple days beforehand, and my parents were still kind of chaperoning me, uh, which at the age of 42 was a unique situation in itself to not be allowed to drive and to not uh, not have the freedoms that a typical 42-year-old man with, you know, seven to nine-year-old daughters would have. So, um it was, it was, I felt blessed to be able to talk to those guys, give them thanks for building me a safe race car. Um, and at the same time, tell them that I was ready to get back in it and looking forward to it when that time allowed. Uh, everything changed in the couple weeks after that because we didn't get to go to Atlanta and we didn't get to race and the world has um, changed quite a bit. But the reality is, is that it's going to reboot itself on Sunday. All right, we're going to close this out with uh, James Harris. Hi, Ryan. Uh, thanks for doing this again. Um, looking ahead to Charlotte, uh, two races next week. What are your thoughts looking ahead to that? <laughs> I want to get through Darlington first. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's a bad question. I just uh, really haven't even focused on Charlotte. I want to get through Darlington uh, twice. Uh, learn what we need to do with our race cars. Um, I do feel that uh, Darlington and Charlotte are somewhat of sister racetracks in which you can apply some similar thoughts and processes there because they do have a lot of bumps and content to make the cars handle well. So, uh, you know, I think that I really haven't personally focused on Charlotte until we get some laps under our belt after Sunday in Darlington. And after Sunday in Darlington, we'll think about Wednesday in Darlington and, and how that can tie into Charlotte. Uh, that's just my personal it, focus as of right now. It, it might be better phrased. How about a dual two races in such a short period of time that you're doing the same thing both tracks? Oh, I've I've done several races in several days in a row before. That's no big deal. Um, you know, I, I I feel like the way that the the schedule is set, um, doing the one day shows, we wouldn't be doing something that we physically weren't capable of, uh, or asked upon us by by everybody that's involved. Um, and that's from driving the race cars to the hauler drivers to the pit crews and every, everybody involved. So I, I, I think that that's not a big deal. It's not an easy task, but I don't think that that's insurmountable. All right, Thank guys, um, we're going to have to come to a conclusion here. Ron has some uh, commitments after this, but I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And we also really want to thank everybody for the patience and the professionalism of which uh, you guys have handled the situation. We know that, uh, you know, it's probably not been any less difficult for you at times covering this than, than it has been for us. And we do appreciate uh, We don't have a single complaint out of anybody. And thanks again for being here today. And, and thanks for that. Thanks, yeah, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, thanks you. From friends. Take care, guys. Thanks, Newman.